We'll be in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I left one important item off my list. Michelle, your magic number is 5. And do you go tomorrow? Yes, uh, Tuesday. 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 So Tuesday we'll be down to 4. four. Working on it. Good girl, stay after it. Yes. Gonna get this done. Yes, I am. Second Corinthians chapter five. We're gonna get all the way into verse one before we preach a while. Uh, look at chapter five, verse one. We know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven. <coughs> Not built by human hands. It sounds like a heavy funeral, doesn't it? If this temporary tent, if this earthly tent that we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built with human hands. At least in our culture, the United States, tents are meant to be temporary. If you see a tent city pop up, you know that somebody's got problems and that hopefully they're going to live in that tent for a little while and then they're going to find something else. When Becky was a young teenager, I think, maybe just preteen, uh, her mom and dad owned two different properties near Harding University and so they challenged each other to try to sell those properties and they sold the properties on the same day. So they ended up without a place to live. And so Becky lived in a tent for a time. Well, while they were living in the tent, uh, Daddy was building a cabin for them next door to where the tent was located. A beautiful location, but you wouldn't really want to live in a tent on that location. And so he got the cabin built for them as quickly as they possibly could. He also had a, an old trailer that he used as a shop. It got converted into bedrooms for the kids. And so if you want to see uh, where Becky slept as a child, it was parked in my backyard right now over at the, the cottage. But there is, there was always a desire to move up, right? We've got a tent today, but don't worry, we're going to move into to a cabin soon. And then once they moved into the cabin, then they were looking for uh, bigger and better and more permanent accommodations. And that's where we are as human beings. We don't mind where we are. It's kind of nice being human, but it's temporary. It's a tent. It's something that we don't hope to live in forever, but something that we are accommodated by for a certain period of time. Paul points out two important things in this verse. Number one, our current condition is incomplete. It's not the forever. It's not the always. And secondly, our future home is permanent, and it's God-built. So those two things should be encouraging enough in and of themselves, but he has more to say about it. But we have an eternal home in the heavens that has been prepared for us by God. If you'd like to, hold your finger there in 2 Corinthians and run over to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. John's Gospel has the most amazing, wonderful introduction of the four. Um, the other three are great in their own right. But John starts out with, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. When you get down to verse 14, he gives us the, the big picture. The Word became <coughs> flesh and made his dwelling among us. We've seen his glory. The glory of the one and only Son, the one who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. The word that's used in 2 Corinthians 5 and the word that's used in John chapter 1 verse 14 to describe the tent are the same word. So Paul says we're living in this temporary tent and Jesus came and lived in this temporary tent so that you and I would have an opportunity to live in the forever house that God is preparing for us somewhere else. God prepared a physical tent for Jesus like he prepared a physical tent 
for each one of us, but it was temporary. And having lived in it, having died in it, having been resurrected from it, he moved on to live in the forever uh, abode in the heavens. Look at John chapter 14. More good news from Jesus. John chapter 14, beginning in verse 1. This is good news that replaces really bad news. The end of chapter 13 we almost uh, always overlook. The end of 13 is where Jesus looks at Jesus and he says, Will you really lay down your life for me? Uh, very truly I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. So Peter says, I'll go with you to the end of the world. I'll suffer with you. I'll die with you. I'll do whatever Jesus says. No, you won't. Look at uh, chapter 14, verse 1. The next thing Jesus says is, Don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms, the old translation said, in my Father's house are many mansions. But we're not so. Would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. So Jesus says, I came and I was temporarily in a tent like yours, but now I'm going to prepare a place for you in my father's house. It's a marriage passage, by the way. It's what those guys did in those days. When they got engaged, they built a room onto the back of mom and dad's house. It was the bridal suite. And then on the night of their wedding, the groom would go over to the bride's house and would receive his property, would receive his bride, and they would walk all the way back with lanterns shining, and they would have a big feast, and they would move into that room in the parents' house. And now, in our day and age, we think, well, that doesn't sound that enticing. I don't, don't really want to move in with mom and dad. But think about who we're talking about. Jesus says, I'm going to go prepare a place for you in my father's house. Now, the whole idea of a bunch of mansions lined up along the street of gold is nice, but living in the same house with the Father, with the Creator, that's an even more exciting picture that Jesus draws for his disciples. He said, right now things are tough. Right now things are going to be difficult. But in the end, you're going to throw off this temporary tent, and I'm going to make a place for you in the heavenlies, in my Father's house. I want us to have a quick mini-sermon now from verses 2 through 5 that has to do with the difference between being a Christian and just being suicidal. Right? Chapter 5, beginning in verse 2 of 2 Corinthians. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened, because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the Spirit as a deposit and guarantees what is to come. For those of you that were in class this morning, one of the passages that we ran across in Revelation was this idea of make sure that you're clothed that you're ready, right? And so here Paul says, we don't want to be unclothed. We want to be reclothed, clothed with something good. But there are people in this world who want to throw off this tent, not because they have hope of a better abode. They just want to stop being part of this. This is so abhorrent to them. Life as we know it <clears throat> is so horrible to them and for them that they just want to get rid of the tent. Uh, some want to hurt others on their way out. Uh, if you've ever known someone who was contemplating suicide, sometimes it is a way to say, I'm so mad at what you did to me that my death will hurt you, so I'm going to die. Right? They want to get out of the tent, but they're not headed towards something better. They're just wanting to get rid of this. Paul says we don't want to just be unclothed. We don't want to just get rid of what is. There's something more important that we're looking forward to. They're not looking to gain something. They're looking to lose something. They hate this life. They hate that job. They hate these people. They hate that relationship. Whatever it is that is guiding their thinking, 
They go beyond rationality into an area where they say, you know, it would be better for me if I just got rid of this tent. And so they do. But Christians embrace the idea of death not as an escape from the current situation, but as an opportunity to enter into a better situation. The same God that made the physical has prepared the spiritual, and he's prepared a massive upgrade at great expense. When Becky and I moved into one of the first parsonages where we lived, I told her, I said, you know, I'm, I'm sorry that I'm not providing a better house for you. And she said, this house has central heat and air. I've never had that before. <laughs> So, you know, I, I married the right woman. It, you know, she, she didn't move, move in with me out of the Taj Mahal. But, uh, you know, there, there are things that are better than where we were. And so God has given us a massive upgrade in the heavenlies. We haven't experienced it yet, but we know the one who prepared it. We know the architect, and we trust him, and we know that it will be wonderful. Jesus was not suicidal. He had a mission. You read that passage where it says, From that time on, Jesus set his face toward Jerusalem. It's a telling verse. He had a job to do. It was what he came to the planet to accomplish. He would talk to his father in terms of, Father, I'm completing the job that you gave me to do. He's on the cross, and he cries out to the father, It is finished. Right? That tent was a means to an end. And Jesus wasn't suicidal when he sought death. He was heroic and wanting to give to us a gift that we could have never purchased for ourselves. He had already been there. He would tell people, nobody has seen the Father except the Son who was in the bosom of the Father, and now he is making him known. He'd already been there. Philippians 2 says he emptied himself and took on the form of a servant. But he had already been there. He already knew what the better was like. So he came down, emptied himself, lived in the tent for a while, but he set his face toward Jerusalem for the job he had to do, not for himself, but so he could purchase our right to be there too. When you know how good it is and you want to take your friends to go see it, it's a beautiful thing, isn't it? Have you ever had a situation where you didn't want your friends to come see? You were ashamed of it. You didn't think that they would enjoy being there. And have you ever had a time when you were so comfortable and so happy that you wanted your friends to come and see what you knew, to come and be with the people that you were with, to come be part of the family that you had and, and you, you didn't mind who came in because you were so proud of it. And Jesus says to his followers, I'm going to take you to my father's house. It's a great place. It's a place that you want to be. None of us have ever been there, but we trust the architect who built it and we trust the Savior who recommends it. And God didn't leave us guessing about the reality of this upgrade. Here's something that Paul just kind of passes over, but it's huge. He says, this God has given us the spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. So we have human beings who are kind of separated in a way. We have our physical side and our spiritual side. We know that our spiritual side is going to outlive our physical. Our physical is just going to go away and go back to the dust. But the spirit goes back to the Father who gave it. Right? So we know that part. We're, we're familiar with our spirit has a future. But God says, that's not all I want you to know. I want you to know that your spirit has a future with me. So to make sure that you know that, I'm going to give you of my spirit to live with your spirit. So we have a body that's going to go away, but in that body, in those confines, we have not only our own spirit living, but the Holy Spirit of God living within us. And Paul says there's two things about that I want you to remember. Number one, 
if the Holy Spirit is living in your body, your body doesn't just belong to you. You have to make decisions that honor the Spirit that lives in you. And number two, since God has put His Spirit in you, you have a guarantee of the life that is to come. So even while you're living in the tent, you have a guarantee that you're headed for the mansion. You have proof from God that he's going to follow through on what he said he would do. Now, there are people that we know who will lie to your face and tell you, well, I'll have the check next week. Yeah, I'll, I'll make payments. Oh, well, I know I've missed three, but you know, I'll, I'll catch up. And you never quite get from them what they say they're going to give. Do you trust God who has given you his massive down payment of the Holy Spirit that is living within us. So we're still in the tent where we hold the earnest of the Holy Spirit within us. So we are God built, Jesus bought, and Spirit assured. It just doesn't get much better than that. So on your worst day, on the day when everything hurts and nothing's going right, you are God-built, Jesus-bought, and Spirit-assured. You can take that with you through whatever situation you might come to encounter. And when it comes our time to face leaving this tent to go to that house, that assurance that the God who loves us has prepared for us is a great assurance. Let's go down to verse 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6. Therefore, we're always confident. And we know that as long as we're at home in the body, we're away from the Lord. But we live by faith, not by sight. Your translation may say we walk by faith, not by sight. We're confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please Him, whether we're at home in the body or away from the body. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether they be good or whether they be bad. We walk by faith, not by sight. Not a single one of us has been to the new house. Not a single one of us has seen the sight that God has prepared for us. But all of us, individually and collectively, talk about it, sing about it, believe in it, reassure each other about it. Because we know the architect and we know that Jesus has purchased it for us with his own blood. Now, should we desire to see that which we pursue by faith? Paul says we walk by faith, not by sight. But we kind of want to see. But would it be a good thing? Right? If, if suddenly we could have a vision and God would take us into the heavenlies and show us where we'll be after this tent is dissolved. And we say, oh yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to see that. It would reassure me. And then I look back through scripture and I look at people who got to see really cool spiritual stuff who then, you know, went back to living in the flesh and forgot. Think about the Israelites. God parts the Red Sea, brings them through on dry land. When they get to the other side, they say, we're hungry. Why didn't you just let us die in Egypt? And he says, well, okay, here's some manna. So they eat the manna and they get tired of the manna and they say, we're so tired of this manna. Why didn't you just let us die in Egypt? And he says, well, here's some quail. So they had some manna and some quail. And they said, well, that's good, but, you know, we're getting tired of quail now. Why didn't you just let us die in Egypt? Over in Egypt, we had onions and watermelons. If I was God, I'm so glad I'm not. These people, stiff-necked, God calls them, just so unwilling to let him take care of them. God, we're thirsty. He gives them water out of the rock. How long did it take before they forgot? Moses goes up the mountain. Aaron makes an idol, and they worship the stinking idol. 
Just seeing the miraculous doesn't always fix it. While Jesus was on the planet, no one ever did any more miracles than him. No one taught any purer lesson than him. And yet the people would follow him around and say, why don't you show us just one more miracle? So even if we saw the heavenly home, I don't know that it would change us. We walk by faith, not by sight. But someday, someday maybe soon, we'll get to be there. And see him as he is and receive the gift that he has waiting for us. I want us to end with just a couple of verses out of Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. It'll be familiar to you. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jew and then to the Gentile. For in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. And so we walk in that faith. We worship in that faith. We strive. We struggle in that faith. We pray for ourselves. We pray for each other in that faith. Waiting on the time that God will take us out of this tent and put us in that house and our faith will be completed. Would you pray with me? Father, we look forward to the time when we can see you where you are, when we can receive the promises that you've made to us through Jesus. And Father, help us not to, to be arrogant or proud that, that you know we, we could never have done it. It's only through Jesus, through his gift, through his blood, through his sacrifice, that any of this is ours. We know that. But, Father, thank you for knowing what to do and how to do it so that we can move up, so that we can get out of this earthly and be clothed with the heavenly that you have waiting for us. It's in Jesus that we pray. Amen.